I can, I think. Thank you. Oh, it's there recording it already. Excellent. Well done, Hardy. Um, yeah, so Professor Chris Chambers, I won't do it again for the recording, but uh, he's co-founded a number of initiatives such as registered reports, exploratory reports, verification reports. He's part of UKRN um, and has been involved recently in the Royal Society Rapid Review Network for COVID-19 registered reports. And what he's here to tell us all about today that I'm very excited about is the peer community in registered reports. So without further ado, I can pass over to you, Chris. Thanks, Kira. Good morning, everybody. And um, thanks for inviting me to speak at this exciting event. I'm just gonna begin by sharing my screen. Okay, here we are. Good, all right. So yes, thanks for having me. So, um, and I'm very pleased to open your conference and your, your Open Scholarship Week. So today I am going to talk about um, what I loosely refer to as Registered Reports 2.0, which is, uh, as we'll see, um, a, an innovation on top of the existing Registered Reports initiative, which I'm sure most of you are probably familiar with, but to um, uh, give you a, a quick uh, refresher, um, for those who are perhaps less familiar, we've got a big problem in many scientific areas, particularly in the life and social sciences with uh, low rates of reproducibility and transparency. And the Registered Reports Initiative was developed about eight years ago as a strategy to address a lot of these problems by trying to eliminate various kinds of bias from, from the scientific record. Publication bias against negative results, reporting bias in favor of positive results, and, and the promotion of false positives. And Registered Reports does this by splitting the review process into these two stages. So researchers come in before they've done their research, have a protocol peer reviewed based upon the theory, rationale, um, strength and rigor of the methodology. If this passes peer review, uh, the journal grants in principle acceptance regardless of outcome. So this by definition eliminates bias against certain kinds of results because the results are not known. Authors then with their IPA, they go away and uh, complete their research and return with a full manuscript that includes all of the parts that were pre-reviewed at stage one. And of course, results and interpretation and conclusions in, in the second part, and it all goes into one manuscript. Now, uh, since uh, we launched this initially, uh, as I said, you know, some eight years ago at Cortex, uh, the initiative has grown fairly steadily. Uh, it's adopted by around 350 journals now um, across a range of different fields, um, not just psychology and neuroscience, which is where it began, but spreading into a number of neighboring disciplines. Um, and uh, we can now start to say what some of the early impacts are of the initiative. Uh, we're seeing, for instance, that registered reports are popular with early career researchers. We're seeing promising signs of bias control that uh, registered reports are around five to 10 times more likely to disconfirm hypotheses, that is, in, in many cases, to uh, report null results, uh, which is a promising uh, signal that we are counteracting the predominant bias in favor of positive results in the literature. We're finding that registered reports have higher rates of computational reproducibility than regular articles. So that is to say the ability to regenerate the same results from the same data. Um, in a key study from Courtney Soderberg and team uh, published last year, uh, it was shown that registered reports are rated higher in quality than regular articles by expert reviewers across a whole range of criteria um, really uh, that, uh, that cut across the full um, span of what we would consider to be quality in science. And um, for those who care about citations, we find that uh, they're, they're cited about the same, possibly a slightly more than regular articles. These are all preliminary indicators and you know, we shouldn't draw any strong conclusions from any of this just yet, because of course the initiative is only, is only uh, a few years old in, in, in relative terms. So, um, but you know, at the same time, it looks like we're going in the right direction. Now, all that said, uh, the Registered Reports Initiative is far from perfect. It's not, it, 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 I think any initiative in this space has to be seen as a constant work in progress. And there are a number of known limitations of the initiative. One of them, which some of you have probably already thought about if you've considered going down this path of doing a registered report is the stage one review time. That is the time taken for a manuscript to go through this initial pre-study evaluation. 
And uh, this can be an issue, particularly if you're on a short-term contract or you have to get started with your data collection or analysis very, very quickly. And you have to wait maybe two, three, four months to go through a full stage one peer review process. Another problem is, or another limitation is that uh, because of the fact that you submit to a particular journal before you have all your results, which is good in a way because it, it, it addresses outcome bias, the downside of that is that you're kind of committing to a journal before you know your results. And it could be that depending on what you find, different journals might be suitable. There could be particular aspects of your results that you think make it more appropriate for one outlet than another. And yet the registered reports process when it's performed at the journal level, um, it socially obliges you, I suppose, to, uh, to stay with that journal. It's actually not a requirement. You can move um, and start over again somewhere else, but uh, it tends not to happen. Uh, a third limitation is that the format as it exists now is not well suited for what we call programmatic research. That is to say where, where one stage one protocol or plan could generate multiple stage two articles. So at present, you know, you submit one stage one protocol, it produces one stage two output. And there are, of course, cases where you're doing uh, a lot of simultaneous work across different areas, or you've got a program of work where this perhaps isn't, is a, this kind of serial one-to-one -one relationship is not ideal. We're also seeing as the initiative happily expands to many more journals, we're also seeing an inevitable decline in standards uh, due to editors with varying levels of experience being given the responsibility to manage this format and perhaps not knowing exactly what they're doing. And so we've seen ca troubling cases of um, articles being handled poorly. And I think a lot of this is down to just inconsistent training and standards at journals. We've also seen um, some signs uh, a few years ago that uh, registered reports themselves are not as transparent as perhaps they should be. So uh, in one of Tom Hardwick's studies, they found that um, around 50% of the published stage two registered reports were not associated with a public stage one protocol. So there's no way the reader could actually compare what was in the stage two article at the end with what was in the protocol, uh, which kind of defeats the point of the initiative. And so. It's very important that we raise that standard and we standardize the publication and public registration of, of protocols once they've been uh, given in principle acceptance. We've also seen, as applies across the board to, to many journals and for article formats, inconsistent policies on open peer review. Some journals make peer reviews of registered reports available publicly, some many do not. Uh, it would be nice, I think, to see more open review because I think it helps to uh, increase accountability and transparency of the entire process. Added to that, we've got inconsistent policies on open access and the availability of stage two articles. And it's always a funny irony to me in a way that, you know, you can have an initiative like, a, like Registered Reports, which is designed to open up science and make it more available and, and reproducible and everything. And then it'll be stuck behind a paywall of a journal or publisher, which seems, uh, you know, I think uh, quite uh, anachronistic. Uh, we have unclear policies on the applicability of registered reports where data already exists. It's a very common question I get is to what extent is the initiative suitable when you're analyzing an existing data set? And um, some journals will uh, allow this, but if you look at their policies, they're very basic and, and it's not clear uh, how much observation of the data, for instance, is uh, uh, permitted, what steps need to be taken to control bias and overfitting and so on. Another limitation is a, a more technical one, but actually quite a significant one, uh, which is that you may have uh, come across this uh, approach of registered reports funding models. This is where the stage one uh, plan associated with a registered report is reviewed simultaneously by a journal and a funder. And this is potentially really powerful because you're, you're taking multiple stages of pre-study review and you're integrating them into one. So that in theory, you could get your in principle acceptance and your funding awarded on the same day. And we've seen uh, some very successful examples of this through partnerships formed between um, PLOS One and the Children's Tumor Foundation and others. And there's a whole new initiative that's just been launched. <clears throat> now, one problem with this is that uh, many countries pr uh, quite reasonably place legal restrictions on the ability of public funders to cooperate directly with corporate publishers because it's seen as violating state aid laws or uh, inappropriately uh, uh, favoring certain journals or corporate organizations. 
And this provides a barrier to the cooperation of uh, journals and uh, funders in the support of registered report grants. And finally, and perhaps most broadly, um, the current publishing system uh, places huge amounts of power with corporate publishers. They are the gatekeepers which decide what goes into the scientific record uh, instead of lying with the authors and the broader scientific community. So these are 10 existing limitations at the moment. And we can ask, what, we can, what can we do about them? Well, this is where the peer community in Registered Reports comes from. This is Registered Reports 2.0, which we launched last year. It's a free non-commercial platform which reviews and recommends preprints. So we're taking Registered Reports and we're reviewing them and recommending them at the preprint level before anyone goes to a journal. And we're doing this across all STEM, medicine, social sciences and humanities. So peer community in registered reports is not a journal, okay? It's not a journal. It is a platform for reviewing and recommending preprints at stage one and stage two. And once a submission is recommended by the peer community in registered reports after peer review, um, authors update their manuscript on the preprint server and the reviews and the recommendation are published by the PCI Registered Reports website. So the recommendation is basically a short snippet by the, uh, the recommender, uh, which is the term we use for action editor. And the reviews are also made public, either anonymous or signed. And then this is the key bit, which makes this exciting, is that authors then have the option to submit and publish their preprint in a traditional journal, including crucially a list of what we call PCI registered reports friendly journals. These are journals that have committed to accepting our recommendations without further peer review. So essentially our review process, they have agreed that our review process replaces their review process. So as an author, you then have the power to decide where your registered report gets published um, from this one centralized review process. <clears throat> this is how it looks um, schematically. So you begin by submitting your registered report um, as a private or public URL. So it can be uh, held privately uh, uh, under embargo, or it can be submitted as a public preprint. This goes through stage one review process where it's assessed, reviewed, revised, and then if all goes well, it's recommended. So you get in principle acceptance here. You go off and conduct your study. When you come back, you submit at stage two by depositing your completed uh, article on a preprint server. Uh, this then goes through the uh, stage two uh, review process where it's revised. And then once it's accepted, the recommended peer reviewed preprint is posted in final form on the preprint server with its own DOI associated with the open reviews on the peer community website. And then you have this option, as I say, to submit your uh, accepted or your recommended uh, registered report at stage two to any journal that you wish. And if you submit to one of the PCI registered reports friendly journals, then it'll be accepted immediately without further peer review. Here's the current list of PCI registered reports friendly journals on the left. It's currently 25 and it's growing all the time. And with every journal that, that we get, uh, our center of gravity grows. So every time a journal joins this initiative um, as PCI registered reports friendly, then it's committing to our review process replacing theirs. And this is not outsourcing because it's the same, many, in many cases, it's the same editors and reviewers doing the same work as they would for a journal. It's just that they're doing it for the good of the community rather than for the good of a corporate publisher. So many of our recommenders, for instance, are editors at journals. And of course, it's the same community of academics and scientists doing the peer review as always. But this is the current list of journals which you can see cuts across a range of fields, um, education, psychology, neuroscience, um, general purpose journals, chemistry. And on the right here are some uh, PCI registered reports interested journals. So this is a second uh, category that we allow at the moment where um, journals might uh, uh, have additional criteria that they consider relevant to the assessment of registered reports that we do not. So for example, nature, human behavior, judges the importance of the research question and its multidisciplinary implications for the field. We do not, we judge the scientific validity of a research question. We don't make uh, any judgments about how important a question is when we're assessing a stage one registered report at PCI. But because nature human behavior apply this additional criteria, 
they therefore, of course, don't accept our recommendations without further peer review. What they do commit to doing is considering all of our IPA recommendations that we make, they get access to a list and they often consult directly with us about submissions that come in and they can contact the authors to offer further peer review or in some cases, perhaps to just say, yes, we like this paper and we would like to offer you in principle acceptance directly. So these journals kind of float a little bit to the side saying they want to keep their options open. They don't make as strong a commitment as these journals here on the left, but they're still listening and therefore submitting to PCI registered reports means that you go on the radar of a lot of these journals that if you submitted to directly, uh, uh, you would have to go through a single process with them whilst no one else would know about it. So the great thing about this is that it gives you, the author, the power to decide which journal gets to publish your completed work rather than going from one journal to the next. There's a few other features we've added to address some of the limitations I pointed out at the beginning. One of them is what we call programmatic registered reports, where one stage one manuscript can lead to multiple stage two outputs. So you can imagine a program of work where you do, you've, let's say you, over a series of a few years, you might have a fellowship or a studentship. Um, you're thinking that you'd like to publish a, a number of different uh, uh, papers and along different lines and arms, perhaps, of your, of your, of your work. But you don't want to submit multiple stage one registered reports. You want to have one integrated programmatic registered report, which goes through one efficient review process. And you can do that, but you can only do that at the moment at PCI registered reports. So here you would submit your one single manuscript. It might contain uh, three, four, five, as many stage twos as you can justify. And the, the number of articles that it generates is essentially considered to be a design element. So reviewers will be looking to see whether the, uh, the criteria, the stage one criteria are met at each of those, at each of those levels in your, in your submission. The second innovation, which I, I'm very excited about is scheduled review. So the top, the number one problem, if you poll the community on what's the biggest limitation of registered reports for you logistically, everyone says the stage one review time, they don't wanna wait four months before they can start their research. Now, you know, people have said, yes, you get that time back at the end, and it's true, you do save some time at the end because when you go through this three to four months at the beginning, it's time you're not spending later looking for a journal, but it's still an investment of time at the beginning, which not everybody has because of the, the temporal structure of their contract or their project they're working on. Scheduled review aims to solve this by, by planning the review process ahead of time and conducting key parts of it in parallel. So this little plot here explains uh, what I mean. So. Panel A here is the standard review track where authors prepare a full manuscript. It goes to a recommender. Remember, that's our term for action editor. Um, the recommender assesses it, triage. So we look at it at desk, make sure that it's sufficiently close to the criteria to war warrant in-depth review. Um, then the recommender um, acquires reviewers. And this can take a lot of time. One of the big delays with uh, the review process in, in any journal or, or platform like this is the time it takes to simply find reviewers. The review system is very heavily overloaded. And then uh, it goes under stage one review, which can take months. So this red arrow here is the total stage one review time. With scheduled review, what we do is, is perform key parts of this process in parallel. So initially, authors prepare what we call a stage one snapshot, which is a one page pro forma, uh, which outlines uh, in bullet points the key features of their project that they're proposing, like the you know, rationale, hypotheses, analysis, and so on. This then goes to the recommender and goes through a triage process. Um, and then the, if it passes triage, then the recommender requires reviewers and schedules the reviews for a future date. So for example, maybe six to eight weeks in the future. And whilst this is happening, the authors are writing their stage one manuscript. So they're going through all of this process here we, before they've even started writing their stage one manuscript. This means that as a recommender, I can be doing that work of finding reviewers for your paper whilst you're writing the paper. And this saves a tremendous amount of time because when the review period comes around, you submit your stage one manuscript on time. The reviewers are set to go because they've booked ahead. They've said, yep, during this week, that's when I'm going to do that review. Bang, paper comes in, reviews are done and it's all done and dusted much, much quicker. Usually within one to two weeks, you've got your interim stage one decision back. This is an example of what a snapshot looks like. So this is the template that we use and you can see the various categories here. 
the idea is to provide a broad summary of what the research is about sufficiently that a reviewer can decide, does this fall within my domain? Could I judge this if this was a full manuscript? Another innovation is uh, that we've, we've tried to bring to PCI register reports is formalizing the way register reports work for cases where there is existing data. It's a lot of, there's a lot of value in analyzing existing data. Um, there's tons of data already out there. There's many great questions we can answer with it. There's also risks that come with that, particularly of a risk of bias due to prior observation of the data. So when we were building PCI registered reports, we sat down and worked out a level-based taxonomy of bias control that, that is relevant in cases of prior data observation. And it has six levels. And I won't go through this in detail, except to highlight the broad, the broad strokes, which is that the top level is level six. This is what you would typically think of as a primary registered report where the data do not yet exist. Obviously, this is the, this says the maximum bias control because if the data don't exist, there's no way they can be observed prior. Um, and that's fine. But then there's five levels below that from five down to one, which describe various uh, degrees of prior data observation where the data do already exist. And as you go up to the higher levels, like four and five, you get greater bias control. As you go down the levels, down to level one, where data already exists and has been partially observed already and analyzed, then there's a greater risk of bias, but there's also crucially greater multidisciplinary inclusivity which is to say there are fields like economics and ecology and many others where um, data is often analyzed in many different ways that data, there are large existing data sets available which are used and reused. And we wanna make sure that registered reports is as accessible to, to every uh, research community as possible. And so therefore, uh, because of the broad scope of PCI registered reports, we make sure that we build in these lower levels as well. And different journals, different PCI, registered reports journals can decide the minimum level that they require to endorse a submission automatically following stage one in principle acceptance. So for example, um, uh, some journals will only accept level six. So they'll only consider registered reports without further peer review when uh, the data do not exist prior to in principle acceptance. Others will uh, have the same requirements as PCI registered reports down at level one. And the final innovation I want to mention is the uh, recommender's entrance test. So <clears throat> there are concerns about the level of training and experience that editors have at journals. And I've, some of you may know I've been a longtime critic of, of the standard of journal editing broadly. Uh, uh, and we've seen that reflected, none surprisingly, in the way registered reports are handled at different journals. And the solution to this is, of course, training. And that begins by having a gate that, read, that recommenders need to, need to get through in order to become uh, uh, somebody who makes decisions at PCI registered reports. And so we have a recommenders entrance test, which involves 66 questions. You have to get 95% correct. Recommenders can take this test as often as they need. It measures and tests knowledge of the uh, basic principles of registered reports, problems they're designed to solve, it come, uh, core policies of PCI registered reports, scenarios, what would you do in this situation or that situation? Um, and recommenders need to pass this test before they can handle their first, uh, their first manuscript. And this is just the beginning of a, a more uh, a thorough uh, uh, training and evaluation program that we have in mind for the future. But it's already a lot more than any journal does. Now I wanna uh, finish by giving you a concrete example there's nothing better than a concrete example. And I wanna give you a concrete example. If you're a postdoc or a PhD student, have how you could use PCI registered reports to your advantage. So let's suppose you have a program of work in front of you that's planned over a, a few years in which you've, you wanna do a series of independent registered reports. That is in registered reports where the results of one do not influence the design of the other, effectively say parallel studies or sequential but independent studies. What you can do is firstly, design your registered reports or get out your whiteboard, design your registered reports and complete a programmatic stage one snapshot. So complete this uh, pro forma where you outline the full program of work in, in a very succinct way. Post this on the open science framework, either publicly or under a private embargo, which is fine. And then submit this to PCI registered reports using the scheduled review track. Okay, so this is before you've even started writing your stage one manuscript. Select some date for the future for peer review to happen. So giving yourself enough time to write a stage one programmatic registered report. And once you've passed the triage, 
you set to work writing that full manuscript. Now, whilst you're writing and designing the, the registered report in detail, you consult carefully the list of registered reports friendly journals. The, remember, these are the journals that commit to accepting our recommendations without further peer review, but they do have additional requirements sometimes. So they might ha have a minimum level of bias control or they might require a certain level of uh, a priori evidence strength, such as a minimum statistical power. So you consult the list, which is all public and available and transparent, and you decide, okay, I've got these target journals in mind or not, and this is what I, these are the criteria I'll need to meet. When you're ready, you submit your full stage one manuscript by the due date. And then because the review process has been planned in advance, reviews and the recommendation, the interim recommendation can be expected in maybe one to two weeks after you submit. Then of course, there'll be a revision process as usual. Um, and uh, if following that revision process, you get in principle acceptance, we will tell you which journals are eligible outlets and will therefore auto endorse your IPA decision from the registered reports friendly list. And you can also ask for a steer prior to IPA. So if you want to know, well, is this journal going to um, be within scope or not? You can ask us and PCI registered reports makes these decisions and can give you a read. Then with IPA in hand, you now have an approved program of multiple registered reports accepted in advance from one review process, which you can eventually publish in any of the eligible uh, registered reports friendly journals, or in fact, you can submit anywhere else. You're not, you're not restricted to those journals. They're just the ones which are like the insurance policy. They're there to publish your work, no questions asked, because they have committed to uh, endorsing our recommendations. Um, but you can go anywhere else. You can publish in a registered reports interested journal if they're interested, or you can go to any journal and propose, look, hey, I've got this great set of reviews and I've got this really cool registered report from PCI. Would you like to accept it? And any journal might say, sure, yeah, it looks great. Or they might say, we'd like to do a light review first or whatever. You can negotiate to your heart's content. And then finally, uh, once you, you know, you've know uh, you got your IPA, you go and do your research, publish each stage to output as you progress. So remember, this is programmatic. So you can publish the outputs as you go without further peer review in the journal that you end up choosing. To summarize, what are the benefits of doing this? Well, these on the left here in this column are the, the main benefits of, I think, uh, uh, an, an effective peer review management system. So obviously these first two, pre-study peer review and in principle acceptance before results are known, these are true of all registered reports. So if you do a registered report at a traditional journal or at PCI registered reports, you will get pre-study peer review and in principle acceptance before results are known. And for many years, this was thought to be like, you know, since we launched registered reports, this was thought to be enough. Like this is, these are already huge steps forward in combating the range of bias uh, that we see within the traditional journal landscape. But of course, you know, in setting this up, I, I explained that there were a lot of existing limitations and that's what these steps here from the third one down address, programmatic registered reports, scheduled review to accelerate the review process, training of editors, peer review at a super journal level, give, giving power back to authors um, and so on. And you can see that for registered reports at a traditional journal, none of these are standard practice, but all of them are for PCI registered reports. So the idea is we're opening up the process, we're making it more accessible, more inclusive, more powerful, and returning a lot of that control to authors on deciding what ultimately happens to their science. And I think more broadly, taking back control, this is really key, taking back control of our entire scientific infrastructure from corporate publishers. That there's no reason why peer review needs to be conducted through the manifold of a, of a corporate publisher. We do all of the work already. We're the editors, we're the review community. We don't need journals to do this. And if we really want journals to start working for us and publishers to start working for us, we need to take control of the parts that were ours all along. Here's some more information that you can find about uh, PCI registered reports, uh, our guide for authors, which is quite detailed, uh, general information about the initiative, including links to uh, various talks and YouTube videos and whatnot, um, our frequently asked questions. Uh, if you are a journal editor or no one, then uh, you're welcome to join us. We'd love to have more journals on board as PCI registered reports friendly. There are so many benefits for the community and for the journal to do so in, in becoming part of something larger. 
And you can also find all of our first, our first tranche of uh, IPAs, which are coming through at quite a pace now. Um, we've got uh, in principle accepted uh, articles in a number of areas, psychology, neuroscience, ecology. And just the other day we had our first, I believe it is the first ever um, accepted stage one registered report in the field of law. Uh, we also have registered reports representing both quantitative and crucially qualitative research, which was thought for some years to be out of scope for, for registered reports, but it is not. And of course, all of this is accompanied by open review. So you can go into any of these recommendations and you can read the full review history. Sometimes those reviews will be signed. Sometimes they'll be anonymous as the authors, as the reviewers rather prefer, but they're all available for you to inspect. And you can download all of these slides here on my talk pages. So uh, I'll leave it at that. I, I wanted to keep this talk fairly short because I wanna leave as much time as possible for any questions and discussion. But thank you, thanks for having me. Thanks for letting me open your, your exciting event. And, uh, and I look forward to questions. Thank you.